So I'm going to talk about obesity and HIV treatment. My disclosure is my BMI is 28. Maybe that's why I've been asked to give the talk this morning. So <clears throat> I'm going to give a, a very brief overview of obesity in general, talk you through the story of antiretroviral therapy and weight gain, touch on some possible mechanisms that won't take long because we don't know, but then really touch on what should we do practically at the moment in terms of when we see our patients in clinic, touch on some unknowns, but most importantly, what can we learn from other fields? So I'm going to focus on some data from England. You'd be surprised to know our government isn't only focused on Brexit. This is a briefing paper from August looking at some new obesity statistics for England, which you won't be surprised are quite concerning. The health survey for England in 2017 showed that almost 30% of adults are obese and 36% are overweight, so that's BMI above 30 or between 25 and 30 respectively. So if you add that up, you're looking at about 70, 65, 70% of all people in England now are overweight or obese. Slightly higher in men, and actually it's deprived areas that suffer most, so areas with um, high levels of deprivation have higher levels of obesity and overweight. <clears throat> To put that in graphical form, you can see it changes slightly with age, but I think the yellow and the red bars, or the sections of those bars by age, are just quite a sobering picture. How do we compare with other countries? We always like to do that. Well, we're not the worst, but we're not the best. And you can see there, the USA is still topping the charts. This is now looking just at obesity, not obesity and overweight. Um, but Korea and Japan have by far the lowest levels of um, abnormal BMI. And again, you'll all be very familiar with the complications of obesity. I'm not going to go into, in, into any great detail here, but particularly type 2 diabetes, hypertension and hyperlipidemia, all associated with being overweight or obese. And of course, these are all major cardiovascular risk factors. Others, and I think non-alcoholic fatty liver disease in many countries is now the most important cause of chronic liver disease. There's also the psychological issues, reduced quality of life, and also premature death. And again, in England, about 70% of deaths are considered attributable to obesity. So moving on to the story between antiretroviral therapy and weight, let's remember this started with patient reports. Now who, maybe three years ago, had people coming to clinic, maybe on dolutegravir, saying doctor, nurse, pharmacist, other member of the multidisciplinary team, I've gained weight and I think it's my medications. Who heard a story like that? Keep your hand up, keep your hand up if you agreed with them or if you just thought it's not the drugs, you're eating too much. So I think some of us actually, I didn't, I said it's nothing to do with the drugs. And those of you that did say it was drugs, well done, because it turns out you were probably right. But I think certainly initially, those scattered self-reports probably didn't trigger quite such the warning that they should have done, certainly for some of us. So it's those patient reports that then triggered a number of case series and cohort analyses and then analyses of randomized controlled trials. But there's a lot of ongoing uncertainty. I'm going to summarize some of those cohorts and RCTs. But there's a lot of uncertainty about the mechanisms, probably more importantly, the implications. And an area that's ripe for research is, is how reversible is this antiretroviral therapy associated weight gain. So kind of pre-2019 summary, this is a paper that um, I was lucky enough to author with Andrew Hill, who's done some amazing, he's a statistician, I'm sure you've read some of his work before, does some amazing sort of practice changing um, analyses, and Anton Posniak I'm sure you're very familiar with. But basically, a, a summary of this paper, um, in 2017 and 18, there were four observational studies which all suggested that integrase inhibitors were being associated with greater increases in weight, particularly in women. Now, it was variable. Not all studies showed an effect. Some of these analyses are a mixture of first-line and switch studies, but overall it appeared dolutegravir more associated than the earlier integrase inhibitors, i.e. raltegravir and elvitegravir, that abacavir and TAF in the backbone more associated with weight gain than using old-fashioned TDF. But this kind of consistent pattern of being female, being non-white and being older were all risk factors for weight gain. What about the randomized studies? And again, this is pre this year. 
If we go back, there were some clear warning signs from the beginning. So NEAT 001, which was a NRTI sparing versus two NRTIs and PI trial first lines. You had darunavir, ritonavir, raltegravir versus darunavir, ritonavir, truvada. There was more trunk fat gain on the integrase arm. ACTG 5256, this is a sub-study of a big trial. First line again, 5257, which was Truvada backbone, but with atazanavir, darunavir, or raltegravir. And there was more severe weight gain on raltegravir in that trial than on atazanavir. Spring 1, this was a randomized phase 2b study. It was a dose-ranging study, but every dose of dolutegravir in this study, you saw greater weight gain than on efavirenz. Now, that was phase 2, but they did not look at weight or certainly didn't report weight in the phase 3 trials for dolutegravir. Vive didn't, and it was obviously Vive that made dolutegravir. We had to wait for the more recent Gilead trials before we saw the weight change on dolutegravir in phase 3 studies. Here it is, GS1490, that's one of those studies. This is a dolutegravir bictegravir comparison, both with an F-TAF backbone here. And you can see at week 96, almost four kilo weight gain on Descovy dolutegravir compared to three and a half on Bictavi. Now, one of the issues is these are all first-line studies, and people say often when you start antiretroviral therapy, there's this return to health effect. I think whether return to health is still as much of a phenomenon when people are starting treatment much earlier, because really the return to health we used to talk about was people who had very low CD4 counts, who were sick, who are in a catabolic state from this advanced viral infection, and starting antiretrovirals improved their weight. Can we say the same about people with healthy weights, high CD4 counts, and no serious illnesses? So that brings me on to this switch study. This is a randomized switch study. People switching immediately <coughs> or after a year from a PI to dolutegravir. It's a small weight gain in this study. It's just under a kilo. But I think what you'll see, the red line where people switch immediately from a PI to dolutegravir, it goes up, then plateaus. The blue line where it's deferred, it stays flat and then goes up. And it's quite a nice kind of symmetrical gain. So it suggests something is going on. What can we learn from PrEP studies? So um, Discover was presented at Croy earlier this year. This is essentially Descovy or FTC TAF versus Truvada, TDF and FTC for PrEP. And in that trial at week 48, they observed just over one kilo weight gain in people on TAF compared to no change on TDF. Now, the difficulty is, is it normal to gain absolutely no weight over a year in an average population? Maybe it is, maybe it isn't. Is TDF causing weight loss? And there are some PrEP trials where compared to placebo, TDF did cause weight loss. And there's an awful lot we don't know. In HPTN 077, which is looking at intramuscular cabotegravir, which is very similar to dolutegravir, certainly in that injectable PrEP study, they didn't show any differences in weight. And what about NRTI backbone? Again, this comes from the review. A couple of signs here. So the AMBA trial, which compared Simtuza or TAF, FTC, and boosted darunavir with Truvada and boosted darunavir, there was more weight gain in the TAF versus TDF arm, a difference of a kilo. Again, this is quite consistent. There was a German cohort study showing an average increase of 2.3 kilos when people switched from TDF to TAF. And finally, STEEL. STEEL was one of the studies which showed us several years back that Abacavir had a cardiovascular risk signal. But in STEEL, they also looked at weight, and the weight gain was higher on Abacavir than TDF. So relatively consistent findings. What's happened since then? So these are some of the big first-line studies. I mentioned 1490. That's the sort of second set of bars in. So that shows us that Bictegravir and Dolutegravir with an FTAF backbone are associated with a 3.5 to 4 kilo weight gain. Moving to the left, that's 1489. So here you've got Bictavi compared to Triumec. So you've got the two integrases, but you've got a difference in the backbones. And you can see there's certainly numerically lower weight gain on the Abacavir arm here than the TAF arm. Gemini, which is a third set of bars along, what we see here is people on dolutegravir Truvada had lower weight gain than dolutegravir Lamivudine, so again TDF appearing to be protective. But I think one of the most compelling studies of this year with regards to weight is the ADVANCE study, and I'm going to go into that in a little more detail on the next slide, so I won't dwell on that here. <coughs> 
So one of the issues with all the trials that I just mentioned, the Gilead trials and Gemini, these trials are primarily in white men. NAMSAL and ADVANCE, are both studies from South Africa, perform primarily or almost exclusively in black individuals, but primarily in women. I'm not going to touch on NAMSAL in the interest of time, but let's look at ADVANCE. So ADVANCE is a study in South Africa, 60% women. What you will see actually is women were overweight at baseline already with a BMI of 27 compared to a normal BMI on average in the men of 22. But they looked at three first line treatment arms. You've got TAF FTC dolutegravir, you've got TDF FTC dolutegravir, and you've got a tripler, TDF FTC and efavirenz. Now what you'll see is numerically men gained more weight on TAF dolutegravir than TDF dolutegravir and the lowest on TDF efavirenz, plus five, plus four, plus one. Women, plus 10, plus five, and plus three on those same treatment arms. So women on TAF dolutegravir in this trial, <coughs> excuse me, gained 10 kilos over two years. They did some DEXA analyses, and in men they showed that that weight gain is a kind of equal spread between fat and lean mass, whereas in women it was disproportionately fat. So whether that has different implications by gender for the metabolic implications of this weight gain, again, we don't know. But I think most compelling from this presentation was this heat graph. Women who were obese were excluded at baseline, and this is looking at emergent obesity and overweight over time. So red for obese, the yellow orange for overweight, green for normal. And if you look at the far left for the TAF dolutegravir arm, you don't need to be an expert in weight to see that's pretty marked change in weight over time. Now, what about Tango? So Tango is a suppressed switch study. So this is the other trial that was presented at Mexico for dolutegravir lamivudine dual therapy. So people suppressed on TAF triple therapy, either continued TAF triple therapy or they switched to dolutegravir lamivudine. And actually, the continued weight gain was identical in both arms at plus 0.8 kilos. What does it tell us? Probably the trouble is not much because most participants were not on dolutegravir at baseline. Most of them were actually on elvitegravir, oral pivarine, or darunavir. So even if removing TAF is attenuating weight somehow, you're also introducing dolutegravir. So I think it's very difficult to tease out. Or is it nothing and are both the weight gains completely normal? And if we'd looked at the appropriate control group, would they also have gained 0.8 kilos over a year? It's hard to know. So that brings us on to what are the mechanisms. So first question, is this just weight normalization? And I think in many settings it probably is. So this is a study from Tanzania, and they took almost 80,000 people starting antiretroviral therapy. But the key here, a median CD4 of 150, far, far lower than we see in a lot of the trials that I've mentioned. 25% entered the overweight range, 10% became obese. The lower your CD4, the more likely that was. But the end result was that obesity and overweight rates were similar to the general population, suggesting this is a normalization. Maybe it isn't for everybody, though. So this is a US analysis looking at the NA Accord HIV cohort and comparing it to a general population nutrition cohort. And actually, although men and non-white women, their rates of overweight and obesity after three years on ART were the same as the general population rates, white women living with HIV actually had a BMI that was greater than age match controls, which isn't entirely consistent with what we've seen in the other cohorts and trials where it was black women that were particularly affected. Could it be a new lipohypertrophy? This is one thing that's been discussed. I think it's unlikely because where we do have DEXA data, there doesn't appear to be a kind of disproportionate, uneven gain in fat. Is it just simply we're living in an obese world and everybody's getting fat? Is it related to fewer gastrointestinal side effects? So switching someone from a PI to an integrase actually is there low-grade nausea that without very detailed patient-reported outcomes we might not detect, and the absence of that, people are eating more. Is it to do with mood? We know both low mood and happiness and people respond differently in terms of appetite, or sleep. So there's an association between insomnia and weight gain, and is it low-grade CNS toxicity from some of the drugs that's actually driving some increase in weight? 
is tenofovir DF protective because of its lipid lowering impact? And I learned, I didn't know this, I knew that TDF lowers cholesterol, but I learned from my very clever colleague, Marta Buffito in London, that actually TDF binds cholesterol. I hadn't even thought of how it did it. So actually there's this theory that TDF could be binding fat in the gut somehow. I don't know if that's possible or not. Is this return to health? I'm gonna to touch back on that again. So Francois Venter, who was the lead on the advanced trial, when he presented those findings in Mexico, he said this cannot be returned to health because the weight continues to go up after viral suppression has been achieved. Now, undoubtedly, high viral load, low CD4, as I mentioned, catabolic environment, there is going to be a lot of energy expenditure, and there's old studies shown that your resting energy expenditure is much higher when you have untreated advanced HIV than when you're suppressed on treatment, which makes sense. However, I don't think we really understand what return to health is and what the marker is, and it might be something more subtle. If we look at markers like CD4-8 ratio, which is a marker of immune activation, could that somehow be interacting with the appetite satiety metabolic cascade? And we know markers like this continue to improve even after 15 years on treatment. So by only focusing on viral suppression, are we perhaps missing other HIV markers that could be indicative of an impact on weight? <coughs> And finally, could it be something else? So the one that's been most discussed is in the very early animal studies for dolutegravir. Dolutegravir inhibits melanocyte stimulating hormone binding to the human recombinant melanocortin-4 receptor by 64% at clinically relevant concentrations. What this means, this is all part of the kind of energy and food intake cascade. It's incredibly complicated. There are lots of different elements, but essentially this is a biologically plausible mechanism by which which dolutegravir could increase weight. Is it clinically relevant? Nobody knows. What about the other integrases? Nobody knows. But it's the only precise mechanism that I know of so far. But ultimately, is it clinically important? I think that's what we don't know. So although clearly being overweight or obese isn't healthy, we don't necessarily know that this rapid drug-induced weight gain has exactly the same metabolic consequences as other types of weight gain. And is it the fat lean mass, I put mean there, fat lean mass ratio that's predictive? As I mentioned, are the women gaining more fat going to run into more problems than the men who are also gaining lean mass? I don't know. One thing to point out, those pharmacokinetics, and I think we think about particularly age and renal function when we think about pharmacokinetics of different drugs. Obesity is also important, and in this study they showed that for tenofovir, Efavirenz and lapinavir concentrations were significantly lower in obese patients and also more likely to be below efficacy thresholds. Now, everyone was undetectable. It was a cohort study, so people would be undetectable because they wouldn't be on the drug if they weren't. But you think about some other medications, drugs like real piverine that are kind of hovering around that effective concentration and have a low barrier to resistance, you know, is this going to be an issue? And of course, every cloud has a silver lining. Even in Britain, we like to remain optimistic. And actually, this study showing that excess body weight could be good for your cognitive health in the US, US max cohort. So maybe it's not all bad. But moving on to what should we do? Like, I've divided it down. We should counsel people. We should promote healthy lifestyles. This is all obvious. We should record weight and maybe waste the conference as well and collate our data. Now, in terms of counselling people, I think we all must be discussing this, and I think we must be saying to people, starting antiretrovirals, any, may increase your weight, but this may be more pronounced on integrase inhibitors and probably may be TAF. No drug creates energy from thin air, otherwise all of our global problems would be solved. There is still an imbalance between what's going in and what's coming out, but it's likely, I think the most likely explanation is that the drugs are having some sort of effect on appetite and or metabolism or both, and people just need to be prepared in advance to do more and eat less, much like getting older. <coughs> and actually there's evidence from the field of psychiatry that a counselled person is less likely to gain weight. Simple steps. 
Healthy lifestyle, again, we should all be doing this anyway. We know that the population of people that we manage are at higher risk of various age-related comorbidities. But give specific advice. Don't just say do more exercise. People need to know what sort of exercise. Exercise that gets you breathless for at least 20 minutes three times a week. There are loads of websites in England. We've, the uh, NHS has really good advice. But wherever you work and wherever you live, there will be specific resources. And don't assume that people understand what a healthy diet means they often don't so written information appropriate web links repeat the advice don't just say it when you start treatment remind people at each visit and for people who come in complaining of weight gain then of course we must consider other causes we don't want to swing the other way and blame everything on on the drugs um, reviewing family history, one of my colleagues in London, when patients come in complaining of weight gain, they ask what size their parents are as a sort of marker of what your kind of family kind of predisposition is. In terms of considering treatment switch, and we have been doing it, what do you switch to? Who knows? Probably not on integrase, but I don't think there's any evidence at all to support what we should be switching to. And clearly, this is something we need to be researching. Certainly in my clinic, we're not very good at measuring weight consistently. Um, I mean, we're not very good at standardizing it. Sometimes if someone's got clothes on that look quite heavy, I knock off a kilo or sometimes two, but it's not very consistent. And I'm not sure whether in some regards, home measurement would be more reliable, where people at home, a week before their clinic visit, strip off naked, no breakfast, weigh themselves, and that would be a bit more consistent. It probably doesn't matter that much because it's the trends over time that are important, probably more than the specific measurements. But regardless, the more data we collect and share, the better we will all understand this as a specialty. So just some questions about the unknowns. The first question is, do we have adequate control data? Now, some of the trials talk about the general population data, but we've learned before so many times, if you don't choose appropriate controls, then you might miss effects. And we don't know, for example, if we look at the population where I work, where it's primarily white gay men, on average, do white gay men gain the same weight per year as the general population or not? Because if there are differences, we might misjudge the changes that we're observing. I've mentioned already about whether we can extrapolate drug-induced weight gain to the same implications as kind of endogenous weight gain. We'll switch reverse it. I think one of the key things we need to think about is whether this is a pharmacogenomics issue. I think when we think back to things like a back of ear hypersensitivity, where there are clear differences between ethnic groups, that suggests that there may be pharmacogenomic factors driving this. And certainly, if you look at the field of psychiatry, there are genetic predispositions to antipsychotic related weight gain. Is it the same for HIV drugs? And are there therapeutic interventions beyond art switch? Well, that's a whole new field. So what can we learn from the fields that have been dealing with this? So just shout out. What, what other drugs, if you think of drugs associated with weight gain, just shout out a couple to me. Yeah, absolutely. And what's the other one that... Contracept, depot contraception is probably the other one where we hear most antidepressants, antipsychotics. Now, just as an update, this is a statement from the um, Faculty of Sexual and Reproductive Healthcare back in the UK. Almost all hormonal contraception is not associated with weight gain. There's no good evidence at all. The only one that is is depot progesterone, but the studies are almost impossible to analyse because people come off the contraception, go back on it, and it's really hard to say. But we can learn from antipsychotics. Again, great detail is beyond the, the the duration of this talk. But this is a meta-analysis of looking at non-pharmacological interventions for antipsychotic weight gain. So this is cognitive behavioral therapy or nutritional counseling. Key message, people who got either CBT or nutritional counseling had a 2.6 kilo less weight gain than people who just had standard of care. Just telling people, though, they might gain weight might not be enough. This RCT showed that giving very specific intervention modules was better than just saying you need to eat less and do more. So we might need to think again about how specific the advice we give is. In terms of pharmacological interventions, metformin has been studied for antipsychotic weight gain. Again, this is a meta-analysis. Number of different trials. These are all placebo controlled RCTs. This is good quality evidence, although some of the numbers are quite small. Mean difference 3.3 kilos. 
So metformin works for antipsychotic induced weight gain. And this could be good. I mean, maybe if it transpires that metformin is a good intervention for art-related weight gain, we know already that metformin can have benefits. So for example, in this small but randomized trial of people with HIV, metformin and not lifestyle modification prevented Cor uh, sorry, that's meant to be carotid. It was carotid plaque progression. So metformin has cardiovascular benefits. Metformin also modulates T cell activation and inf inflammation. And this study is going to look at the impact of metformin on the HIV reservoir. So there's all sorts of benefits that metformin might have. This is called the LILAC study protocol. Does anyone know why it's called the LILAC study protocol? Little quiz question. Because metformin is derived from the French lilac flower. And that's probably the only thing you remember from this talk this morning. So to conclude, there are clearly emerging differences between drugs with respect to weight gain. We don't know why, but we can still counsel our patients. We must measure weight routinely. A lot of work is needed, particularly to understand the impact on comorbidities. But of course, we must all listen to our patients. So thank you for your kind attention.